Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. My name is Zach Ford. I am chair of the Dusty Baker Sacramento Sabre chapter. Uh, we have a great uh, 19th century themed um, event for you tonight. Um, wanted to have a few announcements and I'll pass it over to Marlene and then we'll go back um, over to our uh, presenters. Um, first off, um, just wanted to thank all those that came out to our luncheon last month. Uh, in Sacramento uh, with Rob Garrett on a Jazz Age Giant, the new book about Charles Stoneham and uh, New York City baseball in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, also, Eric Gray was there to talk about backyards to ballparks, uh, more personal stories from the stands and beyond. Um, some of you may have seen the email or seen some of the stuff on social media that I posted regarding our next in-person chapter activity. It's gonna be Saturday, June 10th from 11 to two. It's gonna be a special event at uh, what's called Little Fenway West at River Rock Ranch in Placerville. So Placerville's about a half hour east of Sacramento, which is a little bit further out than what we normally would do. But this is a really cool event. We're looking forward to it. Uh, one of our chapter members, uh, Dennis uh, Mogannon, uh, has graciously offered for us to use his property. It includes a 25% replica wiffle ball field of Fenway Park and a 2,000 square foot uh baseball memorabilia museum. Um, and as far as that Fenway Park replica, um, it has game used pitcher's mound, home plate, bases, even green monster seats. Um, and then he has a, a, a museum that showcases some of his personal collection uh, from the early 2000s through 1960s. Uh, we are also working on a uh, the next virtual event um, that will be lefty or dual themed. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Marlene. She's kind of playing lead on that with some of our, our members and presenters. Um, so take it away, Marlene. Thanks, Zach. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. It's really uh, good to see you. Um, and Steve, thanks for being here. Steve, Steve is uh, the lefty or dual uh, chapter co-chair. And we have Jacob Pomeranke, who you probably all know um, as Sabre's uh, go-to guy for many things. Um, we are talking with John Leonardakis, who will be joining us on May 23rd um, at 7 to talk about his new project, uh, which is a, a documentary on Lefty O'Doul. And Dennis Snelling, who has written a book and, uh, on Lefty and Tom O'Doul, Lefty's cousin, will be joining us as well. And then I'm also hoping in June to invite Dave Newhouse, a local sports writer, and Andy Dolich. Uh, to join us with the very timely topic, Goodbye Oakland. Their new book just came out. So uh, as an A's fan, uh, you can imagine my feelings about what's going on with this. Um, it is getting to be conference time. Um, the IWBC Sabre Women in Baseball Conference, the call for papers will be going out this week. That conference is at the end of September. The theme this year is Through the Lens of Baseball. So if any of you are inclined to present a paper or uh, do a presentation on women in baseball through the lens of baseball, looking very broadly at art and music and uh, announcers and photographers, journalists, um, that's going to be the subject this year. Uh, the, Malloy, the Jerry Malloy Conference and the Sabre Conference are both coming up. I'm sure you've seen information about that. That will be on the Sabre site. Um, for if you need more information. Um, that's all I've got to say other than thanks. It's really good to have you here. And I'm very excited for this program tonight because I don't know so much about 19th century baseball and I'm looking forward to learning more. So thanks again for joining us, Peter and Justin. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Marlene. Uh, a couple more just general Sabre announcements. Um, most of you probably are aware, uh, Saber 51 uh, National uh, Annual Convention will be in Chicago this year, July 5th through 9th. I was able to go last year in Baltimore, highly recommend it. Unfortunately, I can't go uh, this year, but uh, hopefully next. Um, and also, if you are not a Saber member, uh, definitely please join. Um, if you need to renew your membership, please do that as well. Um, check out the Saber website for different information um, about renewing your membership, membership benefits, and then also more information on some of the conferences that Marlene had referenced as well. Um, great resources on that Sabre website. We've had Jacob uh, 
share them with us uh, a couple years back and uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and that video is on YouTube too, if you wanna check that out um, and uh, get a little behind the uh, website uh, tour. Um, but for today, we are very excited uh, to have Peter and Justin uh, joining us. If you are not aware, uh, SABER's 19th Century Research Committee is holding its 14th annual SABER Frederick um, IR uh, Campbell 19th Century Baseball Conference in Cooperstown just this coming weekend. Um, and while we understand it might be a little bit too far of a journey, we did want to at least have this small sample uh, virtually for our members. So um, first, uh, we'll have uh, Peter uh, Mancuso, who is a longtime uh, co-chair of Sabre's 19th Century Committee. Um, tell us a little bit about the committee and also uh, the, the conference. Um, in addition to being a longtime co-chair of that committee, um, he's also a recipient of Sabre's uh, Bob David's Award, which is uh, Sabre's uh, highest honor. Um, he's going to provide now a, a overview of the committee and then uh, what's going to happen this weekend in Cooperstown for the conference. Thank you very much, Zach. <laughs> well, regarding the 19th Century Baseball Research Committee, uh, this year is the committee's 40th anniversary. And it was founded uh, 40 years ago by co uh, by co-founders uh, John Thorne and they were the, and uh, Mark Rucker. And Mark being a West Coast person, I think up in Canada though, <laughs> up in Vancouver for a number of years. Uh, uh, it got to be very, uh, <clears throat> uh, the committee really, really had some wonderful, wonderful leadership over the years, including John Thorne and Mark Rucker and uh, uh, you know, uh, Fred Ivor Campbell, uh, Bob Time, and uh, uh, or Paul Vent. And uh, I, I kind of, uh, <clears throat> how should I say this? Uh, I, I was asked by Sabre with about 10 days notice <laughs> in, 19, in 2007 if I would uh, chair the 19th Century Committee. And that was 10 days before our St. Louis convention, uh, in which I was planning to go and put my feet up <laughs> and listen to the presentations. Uh, so I kind of was a little bit surprised. It was completely off of my radar. And I kind of, at first I said, oh, I'm not capable of doing anything like that. I'm a complete computer nerd. I, I don't know anything about, you know, communicating by computer or very little about it. Now, even though I was in business, it was always the young people in my company that did that. <laughs> that for me. Um, so anyway, uh, to tell you how uh, smart I am, <laughs> what I actually did was I uh, I kind of took the position with the uh, caveat that uh, if for any reason you think I'm doing this wrong, please call me or tell me, you know, or, instantly step aside because I was absolutely shaking in my shoes at that first meeting uh, where I was asked to run the meeting and looking out at that 40 or so people uh, uh, that were uh, very esteemed Sabre members, many of them. So anyway, I was very fortunate in that when I went to the convention in 2007, I was, uh, I met Frederick Ivor Campbell. Who, uh, for the, I had met him before because I was a member of the committee, but now I was uh, chairing it. And Freddie asked me if uh, if I would sit with him and Paul Benton, who was the outgoing chair. Uh, and Paul said something at our little uh, gathering that he had always wished that he had had the time to uh, hold a 19th century baseball conference. And I said, oh, wow, that's a good, <laughs> sounds like a great idea. Uh, Maybe I'll keep that in mind, you know, and I'll, I'll try to work on that. I had the very good fortune to ask uh, someone I knew who was a near neighbor of mine uh, by the name of Bob Bailey at the time. He was living in Newtown, Pennsylvania, just uh, here in Bucks County where I live. And uh, 
Bob agreed to be my vice chair at first and, uh, and to be also our newsletter editor because we, I wanted to really kind of get a, a newsletter stabilized, which we did do. And, um, I was telling Bob about, uh, Paul Bent's idea about running a 19th century baseball conference. And, uh, Bob said he thought that was a great idea. And he said, why don't you do it in Cooperstown? <laughs> So I said, Cooperstown is not near anything, Bob. It'll never happen in Cooperstown. It'll never last there. Uh, so I went to Hoboken and I drove around for a, an hour and a half looking for a parking place. <laughs> and then I realized, no, I could not do this conference in Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> so I said to Bob, you said something about Cooperstown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, so essentially listening to Paul and listening to Bob was how the Frederick Ivor Campbell Conference came about. Uh, of course, its first year, Fred was actually at the conference. It wasn't yet the Frederick Ivor Campbell Conference. It was a 19th century baseball conference. It was a one day event. And uh, I asked Fred if he would uh, moderate a panel discussion for us. And it was a great panel. Uh, it had people on there uh, like John Thorne and Bill Rysak and Peter Morris and uh, uh, people like that um, commenting about writing and, you know, authoring. That was a topic of authoring uh, baseball books. And uh, we had some really good people to talk about that. So in any event, <laughs> the conference really began, to, uh, became an annual event. Uh, Bob Bailey was right. People would still go to Cooperstown. <laughs> I didn't, uh, which I didn't think uh, anybody would really want to drive there, but they do. And in, in fact, uh, uh, I'll be seeing David Block in a few days. He'll be coming near me here to Princeton first, and then he's going to come up to Cooperstown uh, with me and my son. And uh, uh, we'll be driving up together. And uh, so we do have some West Coast people, uh, a number of West Coast people attending. And even tonight, uh, you have two of my presenters, <laughs> two of the presenters at the Fred, Matt Albertson, uh, will be making a presentation about, uh, I think it's the Phillies, right, uh, Matt? Yep. Correct, 1895 Phillies. 1895 Phillies, right. And um, and also Justin uh, McKinney will be doing uh, one of our premier uh, presentations, meaning that what we kind of do is I leave it to the judges to judge the blindly judge uh, the research presentations of which there are 15. And uh, so they'll, they'll get a couple of dozen entries and they'll <clears throat> give them a score and then the three collective scores add up uh, to whatever scores, you know, uh, the, it's actually the lowest scores that win. And, and Justin McKinney, uh, I, ha I have the bullpen theater for portion of the day. And what I like about the bullpen theater, I'm not, I'm not the bullpen theater, the bullpen theater is a little small. I have the grandstand theater for a good portion of the day in the Hall of Fame. And, uh, what's kind of nice about that is there's time for three research presentations and some other events in that grandstand theater. So I take the three top scoring, uh, research presentations and they get, uh, the honor of doing their presentation in the grandstand theater and Justin is one of the three this year. So, uh, <laughs> no pressure, Justin. <laughs> it's a, it's, but it's a friendly environment. And what's nice about the Fred, I, re I remember John Thorne once saying, uh, that he never came to the Frederick Ivor Campbell conference and, and, and did not learn something new about the uh, 19th century baseball. Uh, I'm kind of like the bat boy of the committee. Uh, now I'm, a, I'm a cold bat boy. <laughs> and, uh, Bob Bailey is my other bat, is the other bat boy. But essentially, uh, he's a little bit more polished than I am. But Bob is, uh, essentially what we do is we hand out the bats. <laughs> and then the 700 members of the committee hit the home run. So, uh, it's a uh, it's a very active committee and it has some very extraordinary people. And I never, and, you know, of course, there's people who have been coming to the Fred for years. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Bill Rysak, um, 
uh, called it uh, spring break for old people. <laughs> Although when I gave it, I was a little younger when I started this thing, <laughs> about 15 years ago. So uh, we're, uh, we're coming up, uh, you know, on the Fred again, it's every April. Uh, it's a two-day conference. It was named after Frederick Ivor Campbell, who was unfortunately and very tragically killed in an automobile accident uh, uh, only weeks after that conference, actually. And uh, we had a, a committee that approached uh, Alma, Ivor Campbell, and Sabre uh, with permission to uh, name the conference, the Frederick Ivor Campbell Conference. And that's how it became that. And Fred was very enthusiastic about it. He was a he can, I could still remember him moderating that panel and how well he did it. Uh, so the conference itself uh, is 15 research presentations. It's also uh, a, a panel discussion. It's also a keynote address this year, which will be given by John Popovich. It's also a member spotlight uh, interview that Bob Bailey conducts of one of our members. And this year, for the very first time, we have an artifact section in which we have about 10 19th century baseball artifacts that are being brought or images of them are being provided uh, by our uh, by members who are attending the conference. And uh, what's really great about that is uh, we have some people on the committee that are really artifact centric. And they, they understand what these artifacts are and they're going to comment on them and so forth and so on and show them. And we're going to be doing that in the grandstand theater so everybody can see it. And uh, there's a, they have a really good visual equipment and so forth. So it, it'll really be a, a, a nice event, we think. So uh, basically, uh, that's what the conference is about. Uh, it's two days. This year, it's kind of interesting. Uh, with the exception of the research presentation, and we, are you, if, Zach, if you were in uh, Baltimore last year, you might remember <clears throat> uh, there was a presentation, a research presentation given by a young man from uh, Minneapolis, don't say the member, and it was uh, called 19th Century Baseball Color Lines. So that's something that has always intrigued us and intrigued me particularly. And uh, I decided uh, to naturally to go to that presentation and who was there, but my moderator, Bill Reiser. <laughs> you know, so Bill was sitting there in that presentation also. And uh, lo and behold, as we're leaving, I said to Bill, this would be a great topic for a panel discussion with the Fred next year. <laughs> and Bill agreed wholeheartedly. So we... Uh, so we're having a panel discussion on 19th century baseball color lines. There, there are a number of them, unfortunately, but uh, there were a number of them. And uh, also four of the research presentations have to do with African-American players, which I find very, very interesting. So it happened to just kind of fall out this way this year. I mean, it's, we've had, you know, uh, presentations before on African-American uh 19th century players and other personalities. And uh, this year, the half just happens to be four and, and, the, and that panel discussion. So it'll be, I think it'll be a very, very interesting conference. And it kind of fits uh, very closely to what is my motto. Uh, when I sign off on anything as the chairman of the co-chair of the committee now, I'll always say, because baseball history is not only baseball history. All right, I'm not, I'm not getting you, Zach. So. Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that overview of the committee and the, and the conference. Um, we do wanna make sure we have plenty of time for uh, Justin, uh, but do we have, maybe have time for one or two questions of Peter about either the committee or the, the conference. And we have anything for them? Did you say there were 700 okay. members of your committee? Yes. Is that the largest committee in Saber? Jacob, I don't think so, right? <laughs> it's There's a few more. It, it's definitely top five. I'm not sure if it's wow. number one or not, but. 
Congratulations. Very impressive. Well, yeah, I, it was a good it was a good size committee to start with, and it, and it really has added on. We do a lot of things. Uh, we try to do things year round, and uh, we do a lot of stuff virtually. And Bob Bailey uh, is, is very much responsible for that, and, and is very kind of masterful at it. Zach, I want to thank well, you. Thank you very much. Yes, and I want to thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. I, I, and if you ever want I know to you're do, a few hours ahead of us. <laughs> we do an event that may, interest, that may interest you. We do one virtual event every year or two or three sometimes. Uh, we, do, we do a regional specific 19th century baseball interdisciplinary symposium. So we go to a location like New York City, we've done in Providence, Rhode Island, and another in Cleveland, another in Minneapolis, another, and a few others, Philadelphia. And uh, we do a present, present uh, we do an interdisciplinary presentations. Uh, and we ask for some historians that are not necessarily baseball historians, but are historians that uh, talk a little bit about the 19th century uh, and the period in which the baseball was played. And then, of course, we do have presentations on it. So uh, if any of you, if Zach, if you, or Marlene, if you have any interest in that, I know there's 19th century baseball on the West Coast for sure. So uh, if you ever think about doing something like that, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. We'll do. Thanks, Peter. We really You're appreciate welcome. it. Yeah, You're Thanks. All right, we'll go ahead and pass this over. I mean, uh, we are very excited to have um, Justin McKinney um, speak with us today about his new book, uh, Baseball's Union Association, The Short, Strange Life of a 19th Century Major League, uh, which is currently out and available through McFarland. Um, also, big news over the last month since we sent out this invite, uh, Justin is one of only three winners for the 2023 Sabre Baseball Research Award. So big deal. That's very cool. Um, and then coincidentally, uh, the other two winners, uh, Judith uh, Heltner and James Walker, um, they they received an award for uh, Red Barber. Uh, we had that uh a few meetings ago, and then uh, either the last meeting or two meetings ago, we had Robert Fitz on uh, Nishibe Yaku. I'm going to mispronounce that, uh, but the new Sabre publication on the U.S. tours of Japan. So I uh, apologize for the butchering of the uh, of the uh, the name there, but uh, we are very excited uh, that Justin received that award, and we're glad that he joined us today. Uh, Justin is a baseball researcher, a researcher and archivist living in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He has written articles uh, on 19th century baseball and early 20th century baseball for Sabre's research journal um, and Sabre biography project. And he also writes about deceased players uh, at Baseball Obscuria. Um, so, we are glad that you're able to join us uh, tonight, Justin. Please share with us about, uh, you know, how this uh, project came about um, and this uh, interesting uh, union association league. Yeah, sure. I, I could talk a bit about that. And then I actually have an actual dedicated presentation I can go into a bit too as well. Um, oh, great. Um, whatever works best for you. So, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, the book come, came about in large part through involvement with 19th Century Committee and a few other committees like the, the Biographical Research Committee and the Pictorial History Committee and just became very interested in these very obscure players. Um, the Union Association is filled with a lot of the most obscure players of all time. And uh started building up case files trying to track down photographs of these guys and death dates for some of these guys and as i did that over the span of a couple of years i i realized i had all this information about the union association and then i found out the union association no one had written a book on it uh which surprised me because in baseball someone's written a book on everything it seems um and through the process of being involved with the committees i befriended 
people like Peter Morris, and he's a wonderful author and researcher. And I just asked him, how'd you write a book? And then he sort of spelled it out for me and put me in touch with his editor at, at McFarland and sort of got the ball rolling and then sort of wrote the book over the past couple of years. And then then it now it's out in the world. So yeah, that's kind of the, the short version of that. Sorry, I think you're still muted, sorry. And I made that mistake again. I got a dog yapping in the background, so I'm <laughs> muting myself more Understandable, often. yeah, it's all good. <laughs> uh, but uh, you should have the capability if you if you wanted to share your screen. Sure, that's what I'd, you're... I'd love to. Yeah, so I'll just do that. Just bear with me for a moment, and then we will be good. Um, so I've been... As I've been, I've been talking to a bunch of different Saber chapters about the book, and one thing that's been fun is to try and tailor the content a little bit to the geographical region uh, that I'm in. So California and the Union Association are sort of tied together in a way that is kind of under-discussed and under-explored, so I'll get to that, but we'll start with sort of a summary of sort of California and the regions of baseball in California, and then we can get to the Union Association. So. First question is when did it come to uh, California? I mean, essentially, baseball as we know it starts in New York City in the 1820s, the 1840s. Sort of by the mid 1840s, you start having formalized rules developed. Uh, notably, the Knickerbocker Club put the rules in writing in 1845. So that sort of is like the key document um, that is best known that establishes sort of the 90 feet baselines uh, between bases and nine inning games. Um, and one of the members of the Knickerbocker Club was a man named Alexander Cartwright. He was a member of the club. He's His role in the development of baseball is kind of overstated, but he is in the Hall of Fame for various reasons. Uh, and he actually headed out to California uh, after the 1849 gold rush. Um, he didn't stay long. He actually relocated to Hawaii shortly after. So it's not evident that he brought baseball to California. But other members of the Knickerbockers and New York City clubs also came west uh, around the same time. And that's sort of how baseball gets introduced. Uh, so in the 1850s, you start seeing baseball clubs start to appear in California. So um, in 1859, the Sacramento Baseball Club became the first organized club in California history. So kudos to you, Sacramento. Um, the first organized club games between clubs took place on February 22nd, 1860. And then um, one key thing that happens is the completion of the Pacific Railroad. And this is sort of the first time um, that a club from the East travels all the way west to California and the famed Cincinnati Red Stockings who go undefeated um, through the 1869 season and into 1870. They, they popularized baseball across the country, popularized professional baseball, and um, yeah, they played several games against California clubs. And then in 1871, the National Association is formed. It's considered the first professional baseball league. Um, you may not know this, but St. Mary's College based out of Moraga, California is actually this tiny little baseball hub that has produced uh, dozens of players in the major leagues uh, dating back to the 1870s. We'll talk about them in a minute, but they formed their first baseball team in 1872. Um, the National Association uh, disbanded after the 1875 season and was quickly replaced by the National League, which is still with us, as you know. And the Pacific Baseball League uh, is formed in 1878, and that becomes the first professional California league. And you also start seeing players from out east come uh, west during the off season to play professionally in California around this time. Uh, here's a nice woodcut of the 1869 Red Stockings that made that trip um, all the way to California as they toured the country and played against whoever, uh, all comers basically. And uh, they established themselves as the, the best baseball team in history up to that point. And yeah, as I discussed, St. Mary's College uh, is a baseball factory. Um, it became a hotbed for baseball in the 1870s. Um, the club was known as the Phoenix, and the college produced California's first wave of baseball stars that traveled east. Um, notably, Jerry Denny, Ed Morris, Fred Carroll were all big stars in the 1880s. And then since 1878, uh, the college has produced 64 major league players, and most recently, Ken Waldachuk uh, debuted, I believe, for the Athletics uh, in September of 2022. And so it's interesting to me that uh, a college um, has been producing baseball talent since 1878. Um, there's very few uh, universities or colleges that can claim the same. And two Hall of Famers played for St. Mary's College, Harry Hooper, who was a famed outfielder in the 1910s and 20s for 
of the Boston Red Sox, and Hank O'Day, who was a pitcher in the 1880s, but made the Hall of Fame as an umpire. Uh, he was one of the most well-known umpires in the early 20th century. And there's a photo, I believe it's of the 1911 squad. Um, I think Harry Hooper's in there somewhere. Um, but yeah, that's St. Mary's. And so with that, we then can talk about the first Californians that played in the big leagues. Um, in this case, the National Association, it's not officially designated a major league, but it is to me, I consider it a major league uh, for all intents and purposes. Um, and two players appeared, who were California natives, appeared in the National Association. Uh, Robert Stevens, who played a couple of games for Washington, and Tom O'Gan, who played for St. Louis. Um, and Tom O'Gan also, I believe, was the first indigenous player uh, to appear in the majors as well. Uh, and then in 1881, Andy Fiercy, uh, he's played in two games for Chicago White Stockings. He became the first Californian to appear in the National League. Uh, and he was soon joined by Jerry Denny, who was kind of the first star player, um, who I believe he played well into the mid-1890s, and he was the last um, position player not to wear a glove, um, if you want a little trivia there. Uh, and then Denny, he was joined soon by uh, Sandy Nava and Charlie Sweeney, who um, they all played for Providence. Uh, and then Bob Blackston and uh, Hartford Jack Farrell, who is an Eastern player who played in California, they both joined the Philadelphia Athletics in 1882. So you start seeing the first wave of California players, um, not coincidentally, coming out East to join uh, the newly formed American Association, uh, which is sort of set up as the first rival league to the National League. And so there's increased demand for players. And that sort of explains why players were coming out east, coming out east uh, from California to go play ball. And on the left is Robert Stevens, a middle Andy Percy, and on the right is Jerry Denny. And we can ask the question who was playing ball in California? Uh, the top clubs were basically all based out of San Francisco. Um, if you look at the leagues that were formed, there's like four or five teams just based out of San Francisco. Um, and basically uh, from 1878 onwards, there was at least more, more often two California leagues which featured the top players in the state. And the top players were sort of a mix of a few different backgrounds. Uh, you had California natives, players who were actually born in the state. Many of them were born out of the, were the children of uh, folks who had emigrated to California during the gold rush um, and aftermath and as California uh, settled uh, and got more populated, you know, the second generation of, uh, this first generation of uh, California ball born players fell in love with the game and started to play. And then you also had Californians who were born out of state because there's quite a few who were born, born out east but came to California when they're young, uh, notably uh, Ed Morris and Tom Brown. Uh, Tom Brown, I think was born uh, in the UK and Ed Morris uh, was born in New York City. And they, again, learned to play ball in California, but they had come from elsewhere. And then the third class is Eastern professionals. So this became more and more common uh, each off season and throughout the rest of the 19th century, you just have dozens of Eastern professionals coming out West to play it, uh, each off season. Um, and eventually uh, young prospects start to do the same as well. And so you just basically have this proliferation of players uh, in California. And the, as a result, the quality goes up, which in turn makes it shows that like the California natives and, and the Californians uh, get better as well. And so it just baseball really flourishes in the 1880s. And then, yeah, the question of why California, um, again, like I said, um, essentially as the quality gets better, as the pay gets better, players start coming out east. Um, and then uh, you also have this issue that as Baseball expands. Baseball starts going through a boom period in the 1880s. You have the American Association Forum. You have a bunch of new minor leagues forum, and eventually the Union Association Forums in 1884. And the result is there is more need for players, and so California becomes a breeding ground for players who can fill roster spots across the country. Um, and then there's also the networking aspect of things, um, in which players, uh, basically from the east, go to California, see other players from California recommend those players to clubs out east. And then that is sort of how you start having this migration as well. And here's an interesting, like, odd little factoid, I guess, um, is that Reading, Pennsylvania um, becomes kind of the first hub for California players. One of the key hubs for players coming out east, um, oddly enough, um, starting in 1880. 
1882. Um, you have Ed Morris, who becomes one of the best left-handed pitchers of the 19th century. Um, he comes to play for um, the Reading Active semi-pro club at the suggestion of Johnny Wood, who's one of the Hall of Fame pitcher and shorts up uh, for the New York Giants. And then um, he recruits an old teammate of his called Henry Moore. Uh, and essentially Redding starts to get California players. And then in 1883, when Redding is in the Interstate Association, uh, Morris and Moore, they are two star players. They recruit a catcher named Fred Carroll, who comes out west as well, or comes out east. And then um, all three guys are talented players, but they sort of are clicky and the club is riddled with dissension. And at one point, Morris makes, made the remark uh, that he would have a California here, nine here before too long. And as such, that's sort of a threat that he's going to um, enlist some of more of his buddies to come out east and uh, replace the rest of the team. Uh, but they're all talented players. But yeah, there's there's still very much a, a bias or an east west divide uh, between you know, the Californians kind of stick together. And on the left, there's Ed Morris. Uh, and then on the right is his uh, longtime catcher, Fred Carroll. And they both started with Pittsburgh uh, throughout uh, the late 1880s. And so to understand what's happening with the Union Association and how California fits in there, um, we need to talk about how it came about. So baseball's booming, as we discussed. The American Association is doing well. The National League is doing well. and the Union Association is formed in fall of 1883 as sort of in part by some other people who want to get into, get into baseball and make some money if they could. Um, the plan would be there would be an eight-team circuit. They would ignore the reserve rule, which is basically um, a rule that was in place that um, teams could hold on to up to 10 players each year um, so that they couldn't sign with other teams. And this is meant to preserve sort of stability and keep salaries down. But the Union Association basically forms in opposition to that. And um, to start the 1884 season, you had 28 teams across three major leagues. And by the end of the season, you end up having uh, 33 major league teams appear. And for the record, there's 30 major league teams now. And this 1884 season sees a record number of major league teams taking the field. And there's more minor league teams than ever before. So in, as 1883 turns to 1884, there's more people being paid to play baseball than at any point in human history up to that point. Um, and this leads to an increased demand for players, pressure to find diamonds, the rough, warm bodies, anyone who can, uh, in theory, catch a ball or hit a ball or throw a ball, uh, it, it would get a chance this year. And that results in more Californians. And so we see Reading as this sort of pit stop in 1883. And it continues in 1884, they have more California players. But the Washington Nationals are one of the new clubs in the Union Association. Um, they're a weak club. They're looking to basically find talented players on the cheap. And so they look to California. And so um, we have Morris and Carroll. They sign with Columbus of the American Association, and they become a star battery, and they become you know very good. Uh, and they migrate from yeah Redding to Columbus, and then Redding signs three more California players: uh, Charlie Gagas, Pete Megan, and John Cullen in AA4. Henry Moore signs with uh, Washington, and he's joined the opening, opening day roster by a highly touted teenage catcher named Mark Cregan, uh, who is another teammate from California. And you just see that more and more players are coming from California. Someone out east knows them, and then that is the incentive for them to come out east and try their, try their hand at uh, the Union Association or whatever other league or team that they can find a job at. And Cregan doesn't last long. He plays only about five games, uh, but Moore proves to be the best player in the club. And I'll talk a little bit about Henry Moore just because he's a very fascinating figure in 19th century baseball. Um, he's quite enig enigmatic. He hit 336 in his only season in the Union Association, which again, only less than one season, but he never played in another major league game uh, despite his obvious talent. He was an enigmatic and troubled figure. He often got in fights with uh, teammates and management. Um, he ended up playing with Washington in the Eastern League in 1885, but then he went back to California. And essentially what makes him so interesting uh, in part was that up until 2015, his fate was unknown. Uh, basically, he was maybe the most sought after guy by the 19th Century Committee and other baseball biographical researchers trying to figure out what happened to him just because he had this prodigious rookie season, hit 336, and then kind of seemed like he disappeared. Uh, but it was later discovered that he died in 1902 in San Francisco at age 40. 
and um, essentially Moore's kind of like importance to the Washington Nationals is sort of twofold because he's this talented, troubled, charismatic player. Um, he could antagonize and win over teammates, uh, but he also served as a recruiter to the team. Uh, he brought over a few more players from California, uh, including William McLaughlin, Jim McDonald, and Charlie Gagas, um, and they were all teammates of Moore. And essentially, this is like the incident that I think sums up uh, Henry Moore the best. Uh, so um, I found this uh, anecdote by, um, thanks to John Thorne, and it was uh, by an old teammate of his called Bill Wise, who played for the Washington Nationals. And so um, essentially, Moore was denied a $10 advance by his manager prior to an August 15th game in Boston. And then uh, <laughs> with Washington down three to two in the bottom of the ninth and runners on first and third, what happened next? It said he walked up to the plate, smacked the first ball pitch into the far corner of the lot, good for twice four bases. Threw his hat on the ground and deliberately walked to the player's bench and sat down. Uh, Baker, uh, that's the first baseman, and I both raced to the first plate, but the Boston fielder finally overtook the ball and fielded at first base and umpire declared more out, neither run counting under the rule, Boston winning the game three to two. And so essentially he hits the game winning home run, but he's so miffed by the fact they didn't get this $10 advance that he refused to run the bases. Um, I've not found definite confirmation this actually happened. I found the box score of the game. He did bat in the bottom ninth with the runners on base. There's nothing in the original account that says that's what happened, but suppose it did. Uh, it, it's yeah, quite an odd story. And amazingly enough, he was able to then talk his way back onto the team after the game. And so he just had this ability, talented player, but kind of a pain. And then also could just, you know, show appropriate uh, contrition and, and talk his way back into situations. Um, so I'll talk about a few more of the California players. There's about seven players who, from California who appeared in the Union Association. Um, there's Mark Cregan, who I mentioned before, he was this highly talented catcher, praised for his defensive abilities, but he really was, out of his element, he hit 152, and he allowed 14 pass balls in three games at catcher, which even for the time when catchers didn't wear gloves is absolutely abominable. And he was uh, soon released um, and joined the regretting, not surprisingly, and then went back to California in 1885. He died in 1924. And then William McLaughlin, another uh, national player, uh, recruited by uh, Moore. Um, the Nationals used 51 players in 1884. They turned over the roster several times. Uh, McLaughlin, he joined Washington from San Francisco, made his debut on May 3rd. Um, he appeared in 10 games, but then he asked for his release. And then it seems like he played the minors a bit and then went back to California and then died in 1936. Charlie Gagas is quite aside from one of the best Californian who appeared in the Union Association. He was a St. Mary's College alumni. Uh, he's very versatile. He could play pitcher and second base. Um, he began the season with Reading, signed with Washington. Um, he was really dominant as a pitcher in the Union Association. Uh, he struck out 14 batters in his first start. Um, he also pitched a no-hitter um, on August 21st. Um, he it was an 8 8 no-hitter with the game called with his team up 12 to 1. He went 10 and 9 with a 254 ERA, 119 ERA plus, and 154 strikeouts, 177 innings pitch, but he also never appeared in the majors again. Uh, he went, played with Washington, they eventually went back west to California uh, after the 1885 season. He died in 1917. Uh, Jim McDonald's another uh, Washington national. Um, he was also signed by Redding, but he quickly jumped to the American Association before he could. Uh, before the season started. Um, he struggled as an infielder with Pittsburgh, and then he made a couple token appearances for Washington in 1884. Uh, and then he stayed east. He played five more major league games uh, for Buffalo, and then he returned to California and died uh, at age of 54 in 1914. And then, um, yeah, I guess Gagas um, is joined by Charlie Sweeney as probably the most talented pitcher uh, to come out of California uh, in that era. Uh, who played in the Union Association. Um, he was a talented and very tumultuous player. Uh, he set a major league record uh, with 19 strikeouts on June 7th, 1884 with Providence. Um, he feuded with old Hoss Radbone. If you know anything about Radbone, this is your Radbone won 59 games. And a big reason is because of his disputes with Charlie Sweeney and essentially Sweeney uh, quits the team. Uh, there's a game on July 2nd, 22nd, they're playing the Phillies. The Phillies are the worst team in the league, or one of the worst teams. And uh, Sweeney's coming back from an arm injury. He's pitching well. 
they're up six to two in the seventh inning. Uh, they decide to move Sweeney to the outfield for the rest of the game uh, because they're short, short a pitcher. They want to rest his arm because he's just come back from an injury. He refuses to go to the outfield. So instead he storms off the mound, curses out his manager, goes watch the rest of the game in the stands. Providence can only field eight players the rest of the game and they proceed to blow the lead. And so Sweeney's in the stands accompanied by supposedly two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, ladies of ill repute possibly. Uh, and he watches his team lose and then yeah, that's it for him with Providence. Uh, and it's just always fascinated by that story because it's very sociopathic. They jumped to the Union Association, uh, signed a three-year $8,000 contract. So that's 8,000 over three years. Um, he went 41 and 15 in 1884, but he injured his army in 85. He was never effective again. And he returned to California and had legal troubles, including a murder charge. He died in 1902 at age 38. And then uh, finally, Jack uh, Cullen, um, also known as Rusty. Uh, he was born in New Orleans, but grew up in California. And he was repeatedly one of the finest players in California. Um, he had a long career out there, but he also came out east, um, played for Reading, eventually joined uh, Wilmington uh, in the Eastern League. And then when Wilmington joined the Union Association, uh, replacing the fallen Philadelphia club, he was there. He played nine games. He hit 194. Uh, and his season ended when he fell down a darkened elevator shaft. Um, it's likely he was intoxicated at the time. Uh, but then he played out east uh, through HA7, then returned to California. He died in 1921 at age 66. Um, and Jim McElroy is another uh, pitcher. Um, I don't have a photo of him, unfortunately. Another St. Mary's College alumni. Uh, he had come out east to play for Baltimore in the Eastern League. He soon joined the Phillies. Um, he was a disaster. He went just one and 12. And the one game he won was actually the game that Charlie Sweeney bailed out on. And uh, so he won his one game because uh, the opposing team had eight players. And uh, yeah, he had 54 walks in a season when seven balls were a walk and 46 wild pitches and had 11 innings. So it gives you a sense of just how wild this guy was. Um, the desperate Wilmington club gave him a trial as a pitcher, but he got shelled in his one appearance. And then he played out East in 1885 and returned to California. And fittingly, he died of a morphine overdose in Needles, California in 1889. And I was thought that's a little bit ironic on the nose perhaps. And so, yeah, we talked about, yeah, McRoy and the stories. I've sort of covered that a bit. Um, yeah, just the, the two stories of basically McRoy face off against Sweeney and Sweeney has his tantrum and quits the club and McRoy gets his one win. Um, and then on August 22nd, McRoy faced off against Charlie Gagas in what was basically, these are the two match, matchups, first two matchups between Californians in major league history. Uh, Jim McRoy is involved with, uh, and he is the, opposing pitcher when Charlie Gagas pitches his no-hitter, uh, winning 12-1, and McRae is, yeah, shelled final major league appearance, and he goes away uh, for good. And so, yeah, aside from the Californians, there were another possibly seven or eight uh, players who appeared in the California League who also uh, played in the Association. So um, by this, I mean players who had gone out West to play in the California professional leagues over the previous few years. And so, yeah, Jack Leary, Fergie Malone, Bill Sweeney, Tom Dolan, Billy Taylor, Fred Taylor, Fred Lewis, uh, Edward, the only Nolan, and then uh, possibly a catcher named Bill McCloskey uh, may have also played there. So, yeah, you should get a sense that um, the Youth Association was looking for players, and uh, a lot of the players um, essentially came from California, or had California connections because essentially the more players are needed, more players available, uh, more spots available, then the demand for players from all over uh, increases. And so, yeah, in conclusion, um, you see sort of the first proliferation of Californians from 1881 to 1884. Um, it, the, the importance of networking, uh, both Jerry Denny, Ed Morris, and Harry Moore uh, were likely the key, key recruiters who were bringing players uh, from California out east. Uh, Providence Grace and the Reading Actives were the pioneers in the willingness to employ California players. And Washington Nationals uh, in 1804 set a then record with five Californians on the roster. Um, and essentially the expansion of leagues and increased demand for players led to recruitment of California players. And, and that trend continues throughout the rest of the century. Um, and it's sort of, a, I guess you could make a connection between uh, as baseball expands and as um, the demand for talent increases, you keep going further and further out to try and find players. And so that explains like, you know, why the Caribbean became such a hotbed and why you have Southeast Asia, such a hotbed and all these different places 
any way you can find talent and and if you can you know unlock that and find players who can play more power to you because it gives you more options to find players and usually they come at cheaper cost because they're coming kind of out of obscurity and uh yeah so i talk about some of the stuff at length in this book um uh, zach has mentioned uh, detail about it um but yeah, I am active on Twitter and around otherwise pretty easy to find. So if you have any questions or comments, please get in touch. And thank you. That, that was, I did it again with the mute. Gosh. <laughs> I've been doing this for a few years and I still screw it up every once in a while. Sure. Um, but thank you very much. That was great, especially thank with you. those connections to California, how to really piece everything together. That was very interesting. Very well thank done. You. Um, I do want to give um, members an opportunity to um, ask any questions of Justin. Uh, we do have the cat chat going, or if you have, uh, uh, you can raise your hand uh, and uh, speak through video feature as well. You want to be. All yes. right, Peter. And you're you're muted. Just that I Glad just I'm wanted, not the only one. <laughs> I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned Sandy Nava. Yes. Uh, you, answer, you mentioned him at the beginning of your presentation. Yeah. And, uh, was he a Californian? Yeah, he is a Californian. I think you think he's California born. Yeah. Okay. In, in your research. Did you uncover anything about his parentage? Uh, I th I've not explicitly. I think there's like debate about whether um, I know he's one of the players who was considered to possibly have African American heritage. I know he's got uh, indigenous heritage, possibly uh, like Mexican or like Latinx heritage, however you want to describe it. So he's got sort of a diverse background. Um, but I, I haven't I didn't spend a lot of time like nailing down his like specific like whose parents were and stuff. But I know I've come across references to him having a uh, sort of a mixed ethnic background. Right. Uh yeah he when you when you look at a good photograph or a good image of the uh, uh Providence team. Yeah. You know you look at Nabe you look at his name, you know I think he looks like an Italian guy to me. <laughs> yeah 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 well uh, or, or Hispanic, you yeah. know, and, uh, and, you know, I'm curious about it. In Baltimore, he is buried in a segregated cemetery. Oh, really? And he's on the, the uh, African-American side of that cemetery. So yeah. I don't know all of what that means. And, yeah, because you know, I... I, he's one of the players I'd come across, because I spent some time trying to track down if there was any other African Americans who may have appeared in the 19th century or pre-segregation. And he's one of the guys who there right. were at least rumors about being possibly uh, yeah. Af having African heritage. And if it turned out that way, he would be certainly the most prominent. Oh yeah, undoubtedly, yeah. yeah, yeah the, he's, he's, the, great, uh, he's a very fine player. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you this week. Yes, look forward to it as well, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. So. Uh, so just we do have a, a question. Actually, it's a combo of a few different questions in the chat. Um, you mentioned that there were what eight original union association yes, teams. Was there yeah. some fluctuation throughout the year? Yeah. Teams? yeah. So those and, uh, uh, like 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 some of the, like the, the the cities where they were like what were the eight teams originally? Sure. Looks like they yeah. Grew. Yeah. So um, yeah. So like it's, there's it's, other people that we may recognize that were in that in that. Uh, connected yep yeah, sure i would be happy to um so yeah we can go through the teams so the league starts with altoona baltimore boston uh, chicago cincinnati uh um, you have philadelphia st louis and washington i believe that's eight um those are the initial clubs altoona drops out um six weeks into the season is replaced by kansas city uh, philadelphia drops out in august is replaced by wilmington wilmington drops out is replaced by uh, I think St. Paul, and then um, Chicago moves to Pittsburgh, and then they merge with Baltimore because they're going by the same person, and uh, they're replaced by Milwaukee. Uh, so that's the first, so 12 teams, 13 cities, that's like the, the shorthand. Um, St. Louis uh, won the pennant, uh, they went 94-19, they joined the National League, which 
directly leads to the death of Union Association uh, because they basically Henry Lucas is the team's owner and president and the money man behind most of the teams in the league. And yeah, you know, when the National League recruits him, he kills off the league. Um, St. Louis lasts for a couple of Last through 1886, they moved to Indianapolis, and then Indianapolis kind of gets bought by the Giants. And so you could make a very loose connection that St. Louis ended up, you know, messily ends up in the giant, Giants lineage if you really wanted to go there, but it's kind of sketchy. Um, also, uh, Washington moves to the Eastern League, they win the pennant, they end up in the National League in 1886, and they last through 1889, they fold. And then you have um, the other. Uh, Kansas City also ends up joining the Western League in 1885, and they join the National League in 1886, and then they end up in the American Association, and they also fold after 1889. So three Union Association teams ended up in the Major Leagues eventually. Uh, and then as for owners um, who people might recognize, George Wright, um, who was the star shortstop and baseball's first superstar, he was one of the owners of the Boston Unions. Uh, and then you also have Justice Thorner, who he was a Jewish beer uh sort of not magnate but he worked in the jewish beer industry worked in the beer industry in cincinnati he was of jewish ancestry um he owned the cincinnati unions but he had um founded the city's last national league club in 1880 that folded after a year uh, and then he helps he's one of the founders of the cincinnati red stockings which is the cincinnati reds he gets in fights with his fellow owners and is booted out of the club so he joins the Union Association out of spite. So essentially, Florida is like a, an interesting figure who's underexplored, but he owned major league teams in three different leagues and he founded the Cincinnati Reds. So I think he's a pretty interesting guy. Um, and then as for, other than that, like, I don't know, like, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. If there's other questions, I can happy to answer. So. But that's the ownership and the teams in the league and stuff. So. That's some good. You know, those are some good connections. I appreciate that. Thanks. That's interesting. Hey, uh, quick anecdote. Anybody else have any um, last one? Quick anecdote. Quick anecdote. Uh, St. Louis of the Union Association uh, got some notoriety this year uh, for their what was it, Justin? Twenty-three game winning streak to start the season when the Rays twenty twenty and 0, the 20 and 0. 20, 20 and 0. Not yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because Tampa Bay was 13-0. I think Tampa Bay is still undefeated at home. I'm not sure if they lost today or whatever, or if they're playing today even. But uh, yeah, the, you've seen the balloons uh, sort of, uh, yeah, popping up in the news here and there. So I'm happy to happy to see it. So. All right. We're nearing the hour, but if we have another question or two, we can slip that in. You got anything? You know, I really appreciate that. That's the California connection, and it's really kind of interesting. And then how things kind of kind of unraveled and connected to the other leagues. It's really yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Okay. Well, if you, if you do have any other follow up questions or whatnot, uh, let us know. We'll forward them. You know, Justin provided sure. his contact information. Or I could forward on some questions to Justin if they pop in your head in a few minutes. Um, if you had to join late or if you have some friends or something like that who uh, who are, uh, you know, interested in this particular topic, that, but we're not able to join us tonight, we do always make sure that our meetings are posted on YouTube. So within the next couple of days, uh, if you were to go to YouTube and uh, type in any really any of the keywords, Sabre, Sacramento, Bay Area, Lefty O'Doul, Dynasty Baker, all of our stuff will pop up. And then obviously Union Association, Justin McKinney. Uh, 19th Century Baseball Committee or uh, Peter Mancuso. Um, I'll make sure anything that is remotely related to this meeting will be able to pop up in a YouTube find. So um, with the next couple of days, we'll have it available there. Thanks again for joining us. Um, again, we will uh, be meeting um, virtually uh, May 23rd for our special Lefty O'Doul meeting um, and then our in-person meeting at Little Fenway in Placerville. Uh, will be on Saturday, June 10th. So hope everybody has a good uh, rest of your week. And again, Peter, Justin, thank you so much. You have a great night and thanks again. Hope the conference goes great. Hey, thanks so much. All right, have a good night. Thank you. Have a great night.